Okay, so this is uh, my presentation. My name is Matthew Scamenti. I'm going to do my presentation on the health belief model. And uh, today is October 30th, 2012. So here we go. So the history of the health belief model. Um, the model originated in the 1950s. It was um, started by psychologists with the United States Public Health Service, uh, Godfrey Hochbaum, Erwin Rosenstock, Stephen Keggles. And um, this was all started, uh, Hochbaum noticed a low participation rate uh, for a free TB screening where the actual clinics were, uh, were placed in the neighborhoods and um, no, but the attendance was very low. So um, Hochbaum wanted to get to the bottom of this and he started to realize that it had to do with motivation and um, it only had to do if people were... were um, following these four uh, basic um, constructs, I guess they're kind of uh, early constructs when it comes to the, uh, the evolution of the health belief model. Um, this is the most widely used um, uh, health belief theory in public health. And like I said before, it's, uh, it's all about motivation. And the motivation comes in, in basic questions like this. Am I susceptible to disease blank? Um, are the consequences of disease blank severe? Will I benefit from this health behavior change? Are the behavior change barriers insurmountable? So what the theory is trying to do is trying to um, put threat and then also trying to get you to weigh the pros and cons of doing a health behavior change. So the expansion of the health belief model occurred um, at a later date. Um, the self-efficacy was actually 1988, but that's getting ahead of myself. Um, the Q to action was added, and Q to action was um, a way to uh, bring into the theory ways for external events to help spur uh, a Q to action. Um, later in 1988, stemming from the social learning theory uh, led to the sixth component, which is self-efficacy. And that is roughly, do I believe in my ability to take the action? Do I have the skills necessary to change this health behavior? And all of this is based off of a value expectancy model. Um, and it's just, do they value the outcome uh, related to the behavior? Um, and do they think that the behavior is likely to result in that outcome? So it's basically um, weighing the pros and the cons. So the application of the health belief model. Prior research about the target audience. The uh, program is going to be different for every demographic. So the idea that um, being able to do a program and not know your target audience um, is just going to fail. So with the health belief model, you have to do some research previously to be able to direct your, your program specifically to that audience. And you, you always have to remember that this is a framework for behavior change. It's a, it's a theory, it's a tool, it's, it's guidelines. Um, the prior research will help guide the framework of the theory to specifically target whatever audience it is that you're trying to, uh, to have do a, uh, a behavior change. Um, and like I said, the uh, applying the theory will be different for each target audience. So that, that research that, that you have to do uh, before the program is, is critical. And, and this is a very obvious statement, but health behavior is very complex. And to think that we can just state six constructs and, 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 and give them definitions and say this will work for all people is just not ever going to work. Um, it is a theory. It needs to be applied to the specific population that uh, the behavior change is targeted at, and the, uh, the program will benefit if, if the, uh, the research is, is done. So this is a little diagram that I made. Um, these are the six constructs, and um, just like I just uh, talked about on the previous slide, the demographic variables. Um, th th this is uh, something that I, I threw in because it shows that um, Depending on who you're targeting, if it's going to be a child, um, and um, or if it's going to be an adult, and if it's going to be an adult quitting smoking, or if it's going to be an adult uh, uh, curbing their drug abuse or wearing their seatbelt, uh, the demographic is going to be completely different. And 
like the arrows show, uh, the difference in the demographic is going to affect each of the constructs and how you actively use these constructs to uh, apply the theory. And um, if all of the constructs uh, are in place and the program works, then um, we should have some behavior change. Um, and on the right side, I have it say uh, the likelihood of behavior change is, is the final outcome. So we are actually going to start with perceived susceptibility as our first construct, and that's why that one is in red. So perceived susceptibility. So this is the part one of the first two constructs that have to do with threat. They, the person has to feel threatened, or there is going to be no incentive to do a health behavior change. Um, and the, the risk has to be personalized. How much perceived risk needs to occur to reinforce the idea of behavior change? Um, this is a great time to uh, define the population at risk, and it's a great way to show that to that the, the risk is not random, but it is specific to the health behavior, and it's specific to that audience. So we'll, an, an example would be when convincing someone to become a narcotic, uh, to become narcotic drug free, we will start by personalizing the susceptibility by showing statistics that portray job loss or social isolation or debt because of using credit cards to rack up bills to get the drugs to get the fix and even death. Death is uh, the final and the most severe amongst drug users of uh, uh, and we, we have to make sure that we use statistics that are of the same age and the same demographic group that way we can keep the program personalized. So here's another uh, illustration of the constructs and now we're going to move on to perceived severity. So perceived severity is the second of the uh, threat constructs and this is all about seriousness. The and with susceptibility, we target it to the specific audience. We showed them that they are susceptible to these uh, these negative outcomes of this health behavior. But with severity, we need to not just stress the minor importances, or we need to stress the probability, but we need to express the probability that the outcomes will be severe, so that way we can have quick, fast change. Um, and this is where we need to be specific about the severe consequences of not taking that specific uh, action. And an example um, following the same, uh, the narcotic drug person, uh, stress the narcotic addiction outcome as death. Show statistics that they portray accidental overdose data. So by showing accidental overdose data, you are showing that the people that died from narcotic addiction and overdose did not intend to commit suicide. They were they were just going on in their daily lives, but it just it ended up in death. So this is a way to show that that it can hit anybody. It can hit anybody at any time. And when you define your population, you can then target that um, by showing the statistics for that specific uh, population that is being targeted. So these two perceived severity and perceived susceptibility um, are are all about expressing the threat of not doing the behavior change. And this is actually the least powerful predictor uh, of behavior change, of, of the outcome of behavior change. So now we're going to move on to uh, the third construct, which is perceived benefits. So perceived benefits. Now, now we're in the positive. Um, the positive outcomes that, that can occur from behavior change. What are the benefits? And, and this is where we can be very specific. Uh, we can be descriptive when explaining the benefits of behavior change. Um, let's say with the, uh, for this example that I have right here, uh, narcotic drug abuse, the benefits would be many. It would, I mean, I really can't label them all. Um, increased cash flow, increased motivation to succeed, health benefits, and, and like I said, many others. Um, for some, it could be very easy, like uh, wearing a seatbelt. The benefits are that there is a, a huge probability that you will not die from an accident if you wear your seatbelt and less chance of being injured. So uh, these are all things that positively motivate somebody to do behavior change. So now back to the, uh, the lovely diagram and the fourth construct, which is perceived barriers. And perceived barriers 
actual or manifested cost associated with the health behavior change. So this is all about the cost. This is all about the what 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 do I have to give or what do I have to give up for this uh, health behavior change? Uh, negative outcomes that would interpret someone's willingness interrupt someone's willingness to change. Um, the example here I have with the same narcotic drug user. Um, Narcotic drug abuse has withdrawals. This is this is obvious, and this is a huge problem for people that want to quit. Having to deal with this barrier is, barrier is always tough, but contrasting all the benefits should convince enough to take the first step towards health behavior change. The pros or the benefits have to outweigh the cons. This is, these are would be considered the pro cons um, constructs. Back to the constructs, uh, this is the, we're going to move on to the fifth one, the cues to action. So cues to action, this is all about an external event, an external person, an external symbol, um, anything external that motivates health behavior change. A perfect construct to implement a reminder system. Um, the ultimate goal is to make people believe that they can make the change, and, and there's no better way than to hold them accountable. Um, you can announce on Facebook that you're going to start running, and, and, and then you'll have people on Facebook that are asking, hey, why haven't you been running lately? Or um, in this example that I have here, Narconics Anonymous would be the best external motivator since you have people holding you accountable and a sponsor to put trust in. These external factors keep you accountable, accountable to your behavior change. And the sixth uh, construct is self-efficacy, and this was the one that was added uh, the le uh, at the latest date in 1988. And self-efficacy is just all about confidence. Confidence that you can successfully complete the behavior change. And, and in order for to, to do this, we, we need to do it in small, manageable steps. Um, and we need to use uh, tools to reduce anxiety. And, and this is, this is self-efficacy, not self-esteem. Self-esteem has to do more with how you feel about yourself. And this is actually about having how you feel about your performance on, on, on completing an action. Um, how much do you believe that your outcome will be positive? An example, uh, maybe our narcotic replacement like Suboxone could be used to lower the anxiety about change by reducing barriers of withdrawal then slowly reduce the dose. Suboxone is one of those drugs that they give to people that are trying to get off of um, pain medication, and um, it helps with uh, reducing the withdrawal symptoms. So that lowers the barriers, and it can make somebody definitely more confident, there's that word again, um, in being able to successfully change their negative health behavior or, or positive health behavior. So the issues with the health belief model uh, it's an individual-only theory, and it cannot be applied to social or environmental issues. Um, this is stated before that it's an individual-level theory, and, and this is something that is in, uh, kind of implied. And, um, you know, here's a big one. Disparities amongst our population, because not everybody has the same knowledge about health behaviors. Some people may not know that smoking is bad for you, even though it to, to the common educated um, population in America, smoking is definitely linked to death and to lung cancer, um, but some people just don't have the education that others have. And so one of the main goals, actually, of the health belief model is to, is to solve that, is to kind of curb that disparity by making people knowledgeable about their behavior change. So um, it's, a, it's a limitation of the health belief model, but... Um, through the health belief model, we should be able to increase knowledge. And then um, finally, uh, I did find that there was uh, some um, some uh, uh, things out there that said that the, it's a very difficult test to measure. And um, when I was doing a lot of my research on articles for the health belief model, I did notice that a lot of the articles were all about testing specific scales um, that helped with the measurements. So. It is definitely a model that is that is hard to um, implement and measure and show real statistical fact with. Well, that's the end of my presentation, and I just wanted to say thank you for your time.